This is the second in a series of videos about trigonometry. If you haven't seen the last one, I strongly recommend that you do, since the way I explain things is a little bit different from what you usually see elsewhere. Plus, it has more practice. The link is in the description. If you don't want to watch it, though, the most important parts are these. Since the angles of a right triangle have a unique relationship with the side lengths, this motivates us to give those side lengths a name in terms of the angle. In a right triangle with a hypotenuse one unit long, we call the length of the side opposite to an angle theta a sine theta. It follows that this other side of the triangle is just the sine of the angle complementary to theta, as you should verify. For readability and convenience, we usually call this the complementary sine, or cosine, of the original angle theta. This notation is optional, however. Since uniform scaling preserves angles, we can scale this right triangle by a factor of h in order to deduce that a general right triangle with a hypotenuse of length h has its other side lengths equal to h sine theta and h cosine theta respectively for some acute angle theta. This diagram is probably the single most important piece of right triangle trigonometry. Now, as I said last episode, these notations are not helpful for finding actual exact measurements of triangles on their own. Sure, you could just type sine whatever into your gaudy standardized test profiteering Texas Instruments calculator, but this is just pushing the issue under a rug for a couple of important reasons. One, these decimal expansions will never be exact. And two, these calculations don't give us any understanding of what's actually happening under the hood. Specific measurements of specific triangles are almost never interesting on their own, and the journey of discovery is more important than the destination. How does the calculator figure out what sine is, anyway? This is why I devised this plan at the end of last episode. For now, let's focus on this first part, figuring out a way to measure angles. This topic is a lot more subtle and runs a lot deeper than you might realize. See, we usually measure things in degrees. But what even is a degree? If you just pulled any random person from the street and asked them what one degree is, what would they answer? They'd probably have an easier time telling you what degree measurements of certain angles are. A right angle is 90 degrees, a half circle is 180 degrees, and a full turn around a circle is 360. But why should a full turn be 360 degrees? Why such a specific number? The answer is probably that the ancient Babylonians used to base 60 instead of base 10. So powers of 60 seemed nice to them for the same reason powers of 10 seem nice to us. It's a byproduct of how they wrote numbers down in the first place, which is just an arbitrary human convention. The question then becomes, is there a more natural way to measure angles? The answer is yes. It is so natural, in fact, that I've already mentioned it, but you probably didn't even notice. Turns. A right angle is just a quarter turn, a straight angle or two right angles is a half turn, and a full turn is, well, one turn, obviously. Evidently, one degree is just one three-sixtieth of a turn. The system of using turns is simple, intuitive, and it's not what we're going to be using either. Why? It's because as a function of a real number, signs should be able to take any plain old number and spit out another. The reason this matters is because in general, functions of real variables don't care about units. The function f such that f of x equals x squared doesn't care what units x has, if any, it will always spit out the same thing for the same number. Why should the sine function be any different, having specific units baked into its inputs? The challenge, then, is to describe angles in a way that doesn't rely on any fancy units like degrees or turns, just like how lengths can be abstractly measured using numbers and nothing else. The way to do that has been staring at us the whole time. By relating angles to the length of a circumference traced, and recalling the definition of pi as circumference over diameter, we can see that one turn around a circle with radius 1 as a measurement of an angle should just be the same thing as 2 pi. In general, for any angle, its measurement will just be the length of the portion of the circumference of a circle with radius 1 it traces out, which is just the fraction of a full turn traveled, multiplied by 2 pi, which is the length of the full circumference. Evidently, a right angle is just 2 pi divided by 4, or pi halves, and a straight angle, or two right angles, is just 2 pi divided by 2, or just pi. Sometimes, when we want to think of this kind of measurement of angles as a unit on its own right, we call it radians. This is the method we are going to use to measure angles. 
To get warmed up with using radians yourself, for exercise 1, convert these angles from turns or degrees into radians using the formula we worked out. For exercise 2, convert these angles from radians to degrees. For exercise 3, determine what the measure of an angle complementary to one with a length theta in radians is. Here are the answers for exercise 1, exercise 2, and for exercise 3, both of these angles must add up to a right angle, and a right angle is pi halves. So if this angle has a measurement of theta, the only way both angle measurements here can add up to pi halves is if the other angle has a measure pi over 2 minus theta. Now that we are equipped with a natural way to measure angles, let us move on to the second part of our plan, finding specific values for sine and cosine using special right triangles. Consider an isosceles right triangle where both legs have a length 1. Using the Pythagorean theorem, we see that the area of these two squares combined is 2, so that must be the area of this square as well. We conclude that the hypotenuse has a length of the square root of 2. Now, since all the angles inside a triangle add up to two right angles, we already have one of them, and both of these angles are the same, we conclude that each of these angles must have the same measure as half a right angle which, from your exercises, you should have deduced as pi over 4. Now, since we're interested in evaluating sine pi over 4, we're going to want to scale the triangle down by a factor of 1 over root 2, so that the hypotenuse becomes 1. It then becomes evident that sine pi over 4 and cosine pi over 4 are both just 1 over root 2, which we can leave as is, because rationalizing the denominator is not actually necessary. The real numbers form a field, meaning any real number can be divided by any other non-zero real number and it will always work just fine. If a test takes points away because you didn't rationalize the final answer, the test is wrong, not you. You can still do it for aesthetic purposes though. Here's another exercise for you to figure out. Use an equilateral triangle whose side lengths are all 1 in order to find sine pi thirds, sine pi sixth, cosine pi thirds, and cosine pi sixths. Pause now and take as much time as you need to think about it. The most straightforward way to approach this is to first remember that the sum of all the angles in a right triangle is the same as two right angles. Since two right angles have a measurement of pi and all the angles in an equilateral triangle are the same, each angle has a measurement of pi thirds. We can cut the triangle in half to get a right triangle with a base of one half, an unknown height and a hypotenuse of one where this top angle is just pi thirds cut in half, or pi sixth. To find the missing side, we can use Pythagoras. Evidently, the square of the base has an area of one half squared, or one fourth. The square of the hypotenuse just has an area of one. It follows that the area of the square of the unknown side is just three fourths, and thus the missing side is just root three on two. Since pi thirds and pi sixths are evidently complementary, they wouldn't make a right triangle otherwise, we see that cosine pi 6 is equal to sine pi thirds, which is just root 3 on 2, and that cosine pi thirds is equal to sine pi sixths, which is just 1 half, and we are done. Now we have ourselves a table of values for sine and cosine. Notice that the row for cosine is just the row for sine backwards. This shouldn't be surprising at all, since the cosine is just the complementary sine, remember? As an exercise, See if you can compute the value of tangent for each of these angles. Anyways, now that we have a database of known values of sine, we can move on to the next part of the plan, which is to combine these known values to get new ones using trig identities. But that's a topic for the- WAIT A MINUTE! Pi thirds, pi fourths, pi sixths? What happened to pi fifths? Why is nobody talking about the sine and cosine of pi fifths? In order to get to the bottom of this mystery, we're going to need to talk about a different shape, the regular pentagon. That is, the pentagon, whose side lengths are all the same. By cutting a circle up into five equal arcs, and joining the endpoints, we see that we can cut up a regular pentagon into isosceles triangles. Recognizing that all the angles of the tips add up to 2 pi, and that we have five of them, we see that the tips of each of these triangles has an angle measurement of 2 pi over 5. Thus, by taking advantage of the fact that the triangles are isosceles, and then combining these neighboring pairs of angles, we get that the angles of a regular pentagon are 3 pi over 5. As an exercise, see if you can fill in the details I left out. 
Now brace yourself because this is where things start getting a little bit involved. Let's assume all the pentagon side lengths are one and cut it like this. Notice that these two triangles both have these sides equal between them and that this angle in the middle is equal in both of them too since they're all part of a regular pentagon. This is enough to conclude that both triangles are the same, which means this triangle in the middle is isosceles. Observe that since this angle is 3 pi fifths, these angles are the same due to the triangle being isosceles, and the angles must add up to pi. These angles must all be pi fifths. Now, these three angles must add up to 3 pi fifths too, so this peak here must be pi fifths as well. Let's add another cut here. Notice from the symmetry of the regular pentagon that these three angles down here must also be pi fifths each, so these two combine are two pi fifths. Since this whole triangle is isosceles, that means this angle is also two pi fifths. Now look what we have here. Evidently, this angle is pi fifths, so all the angles in this triangle are the same as the angles in this triangle. Since uniform scaling preserves angles, these two triangles must be similar. So what is the scaling factor? Well, if we label this side length S, we see that as the triangle is scaled, S becomes 1. So the scaling factor is 1 over S, meaning that this space gets scaled down to 1 over S as well. Putting things back together, observe again from the symmetry of the regular pentagon that these two triangles are the same. So this length is just 1, due to the fact that the triangles are isosceles, again. Finally, we conclude that s is equal to 1 plus 1 over s. Curiously, it seems like we can plug s into itself to get that s is 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over itself on and on forever. And here is where the true identity of s reveals itself. By definition, when two lengths are in the golden ratio, it means that the ratio from the bigger to the smaller is the same as the ratio from the whole to the bigger. If the smaller length is 1, then evidently, the bigger is the golden ratio itself. So dividing through, we get this. The exact same thing we got for s. Now we can finally work out sine pi fifths. Let's cut this isosceles triangle up to get two right triangles. From this setup, we noticed that the golden ratio times sine pi fifths is the same thing as sine of two pi fifths, which means that, uh, well, it looks like we're stuck, and now we have all the more reason to care about those trig identities. See you then.